have no idea if they want this on or off. It's a recording or not. So. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll wear it. Oh. Thanks. <laughs> I just thought it was a funny looking security camera.
really think that's what my grandfather said. Yeah. Uh, on the, the front of the tree was, uh, so for the longest time I saw that there was like three wall acres and it just looked like a, a present. And about 10 years later, there was like 15 of us in the Toronto corner. Like, right. yeah. and they were all Muhammad Wali, Musa Wali, Abdul Wali. Apparently, it's a very popular Muslim name, too. <laughs> it's like things, things my grandfather never told me. And it, it's kind of like Smith and Smythe and uh, oh, Finland. Okay. There's really like they'll fill it with a V, they'll fill it with a W, they'll fill it with one L, two L's, and they're all kind of water. Oh. It's, it's, it's one of those names. Yeah, we were horse spoons or something like that. Shape oh. of like this. Okay. Or, 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 or not. <laughs> so if it does, we didn't say that. <coughs> Can everybody hear me okay? Good, back of the room's nodding, excellent. Um, so my name's Steve Wally, and I am the technical director at the Outer Curve Foundation. And kind of the rationale for this talk uh, started because the Outer Curve Foundation was created a little over three years ago. It was sponsored into existence by Microsoft uh, as a trade organization, so a trade nonprofit. So it's a 501c6, similar to the Link Foundation or the Eclipse Foundation. Um, and Microsoft, actually, do we have any Microsoft people in the room? No, good. Uh, <laughs> do we have any, actually, do we have any other foundation people in the room? I know Bradley's here. Uh, anybody else? Ah, excellent. Um, so what, what happened was, they, uh, as with many things with Microsoft, they created it out of a need of their own and sponsored it into existence and they didn't really think about a business model beyond that. It was kind of what, what was happening inside of Microsoft at the time. This was three years ago. At that point, all of their new hires had been weaned on open source and free software in the university setting. So it, it was natural for those developers. They were happy to work on proprietary products all day long. But there was also all of these other projects, and they saw no reason why this had to be locked down. They wanted to create their own open source project. And legal and, co legal and corporate affairs was very, you know, hard line. We can't take the, the IP risk. We're, they were worried about the patent leakage uh, across the patent portfolio. Lots of things like that. So they came to the same conclusion that everybody comes to sooner or later, and that is we need a nonprofit to park as, as this kind of arm's length uh, risk mitigation mechanism. And so they spun it into existence, and they hired uh, an executive director, and they had a project, and that really was about as much thought as, as had gone into it. Now you contrast this with most other large, uh, certainly th things that would be um, 501c6 trade organization kinds of things that they come into existence, and there's you know 10 CEOs up on stage together. They've got a long-term funding plan. All of that kind of lands together. So uh, Paula Hunter, my executive director, and I, we were, we were kind of suddenly left in this position of, so what is the business model? You know, we we weren't the Apache Software Foundation that IBM kind of spun into existence because they needed some kind of legal structure around us. And when you we kind of started looking across. Um, all of these other foundations, but what is the common theme across everything? And it, it kind of brought me around to this point where I have this thesis that free and open source software foundations are absolutely essential to the growth uh, and health of big projects. There's, there's no way around it because what, it, what, what happens is you get to this point where corporations want to get involved. If you, if you have done things well, if you are running your projects well, you've got lots of contributions happening, you get to a point where you're successful enough that there's either pull through 
uh, financially. So companies want to start getting involved because they want to use it that way, or they want to start contributing. And that's when they, everybody kind of gets freaked out. And, and there's kind of a history here. Uh, wh when, you, when you look at um, open source kind of all up, um, I maintain that there are two ratios in a, that define our industry. And that's the average number of lines of code that the average programmer writes in a day. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about the kind of programmers that show up at scale. I'm talking about the average IT guy. Um, and you will always run into a bug per thousand lines. Uh, the, the guys in R&D at uh, places like uh, TJ Watson at IBM uh, proved this decades ago. And the, the terrifying thing is these ratios don't get any better. Uh, you know, all of the advancement in programming languages that we've seen over the decades, all of the advances in software engineering that we've seen over the decades, um, it's all about writing more software with fewer lines of code. That, that's what we're trying to do at the end of the day. Yeah, and, and you, you, look, you look across you know, 50 years of history in our industry, and that's what it's all about, is trying to get more and more software out. And as we become more and more dependent on software in every device imaginable, you know, right down to you know, the, these things infinitely more powerful than the desktops you could buy 10 years ago, and you know, heart monitors and pacemakers and things like that, we're becoming more and more dependent. So it's all about beating these two ratios. And because of that, we keep trying to come up with new and interesting uh, reuse strategies. And kind of the, the real economics of software, it really does come down to writing good software is hard work. There's no way around it. There, there is a discipline to writing good software. And you always find those people. I've been lucky enough. I am not one of those people. I know what I need to do when I write software, and I invariably am too lazy to do it. There's always a, yeah, I'll do that tomorrow kind of thing. Whereas I've always been fortunate enough in my entire 32 years now to have worked with people like that. And they are invariably the people you have one, if you're lucky, two on every project. And these are the people that are remarkably anal and they know no other way than to walk their way through the checklist for everything they do. And so it really comes down to reuse is everything. Uh, for a while I was, I was laughing at plagiarism. You know, after all those years of being told plagiarism is bad. No, in our industry, plagiarism is good. <laughs> kind of thing, you know, reuse is everything in our industry. And at this point, um, you know, we've shared software, literally since we've been writing it. Uh, there was a talk given by uh, George Dyson, so uh, Esther's brother, and I uh, just blanked on his dad's name, the Dyson School. Thank you. No, no, that's not right either. Anyway, uh, George gave, a, gave this fabulous talk. They had discovered the old filing cabinet uh, on Princeton campus from the original work that was done when they were building the first programmable computer in America. And so he gave this fabulous talk, and it was like all of von Neumann's original notebook. And so the, the, all the slides were nothing more than photographs of it. And there are stories in there, and this is like literally, there was some Italian researcher that was coming in at midnight, because he could still get time on, the, on this early, early computer at Princeton University in the advanced uh, science lab. And even then, we were sharing it because writing software was hard, a whole lot harder then than it is today. But, so we've always shared it. And it. I mean, if you're old enough, if you've got as much gray hair as I do, um, you, you've probably been to a, an IBM share conference back in the 60s or 70s, or uh, I was digital bound, so it was like, I used to go to Dekas. And when you went to Dekas, you could you basically, for the outrageous sum of $75 to cover the cost of media, you could get a mag tape full of software. That you and and that, that was like, this was all pre kind of internet, certainly pre World Wide Web days, where you know, packet size was a mag tape and bandwidth was however long it was between conferences, kind of thing. And that's what we used to do. I mean, uh, we were excited because we had 1200 baud acoustic couplers in those days. I mean, it was so, software economics is all about sharing. And open source and free software, that, that kind of licensing and that kind of sharing really is probably the best mechanism we've ever found in our industry, despite all of the research kind of thing, for sharing software. So that, that to me is the economics of why open source is so fundamentally, fundamentally important. And when you, when you start looking at it, I mean, if you, if you look at the in kind of the R&D investment of what you're building, 
um, and you look at it across time, like all projects kind of follow this flow. And, you know, standard bell curve. But if you actually look at it from an open source perspective, you start seeing that everybody's contributing to meet their own needs. And that's where the economics gets really important. We're, we're distributing that cost, that cost of development, that cost of bug fixing, all those costs get distributed. And when, you know, if you actually integrate over that curve, so you, you look at the cumulative investment over time, you start seeing, if you, were, if you were to present that with Linux, you know, you've got IBM selling solutions, you've got Intel selling chips, you've got Red Hat selling servers. It, everybody's invested in it for their own reasons, but the reuse works time and time and time again. So this is where we started coming into this idea that, okay, so what is it about foundations? Like, really? They've been in the background for all of us. Um, I mean, the Free Software Foundation dates all the way back to, I think it's 85. Uh, Apache Software Foundation was 97, I believe. So wh where did these things come from? And so the interesting thing when I started looking at this was, regardless, regardless of what any of these foundations represent to their membership or their constituency, what they all do is IP management. And that really, and it was kind of like the aha moment for me because that's kind of why Microsoft funded Outer Curve into existence. It was all about risk management uh, around IP. And what all of these foundations are is their IP management mechanism. Even if you look at um, the OSDL that got rolled into the Linux Foundation, even though that wasn't direct IP management, it was still IP management at that uh, level of risk mitigation. I mean, in those days when they first fired up the OSDL, that was all about a hardcore group of large OEMs that were desperately going to use Linux and needed to erect some kind of legal f framework around it, even if Linus was going to walk around holding the copyright forever. Um, there, there is a lot of discussion. I, I get into this debate uh, with a lawyer uh, named Richard Fontana, who is a fabulous lawyer in the open source and free software space. And he'll argue that, well, you know, a lot of the legal agreements that a lot of these other foundations put in place just aren't necessary because, look, we, you know, we don't do that in Linux. They go by on, on the developer's certificate of uh, originality, authentication. Don't remember. It's CCO, I think, is, is the acronym they throw around a lot. Um, I would still offer up that the Linux Foundation does a lot of other work in the background to provide legal risk mitigation for all of its members. And at the end of the day, IBM demonstrated to the planet exactly what would happen if a company tried to challenge the Linux copyright and went hammer and tongs on the SCO group. So it, it's, you know, love them love or hate them. It, it was nice having them on our side kind of thing in, in that uh, pitched battle. The other thing, though, after we started putting this idea of, okay, this is what foundations are all about, the really interesting thing that uh, I came across was uh, there's a gentleman named Henrik Ingo, uh, works in Finland, uh, might be at Nokia now. Uh, he was at MySQL. And a couple of years ago, uh, he was con uh, consulting on his own, and a client who remains nameless but allowed him to publish his work basically did the math so to speak, on, uh, so, so, you know, this foundation thing, what about, what projects end up there? And uh, Henrik Scott, uh, that's the link to the article. Um, I would highly recommend go reading it if you're interested in this space, because he was a good engineer. He laid out all of his assumptions, uh, all of his data. Uh, he basically uh, dug through OLO for a lot of his numbers. That's a website that does a lot of, uh, it basically trolls its way across all of the repositories and uh, looking at merges and the rest of it in line counts of code. And what he discovered was by any reasonable approximation, the nine largest, most vibrant open source and free software projects on the planet are all hubs and foundations. The tenth largest is hubs in a company. And it's an order of magnitude smaller than the other nine as, as, as a community. And so like, he's very careful. He, he says, this is not causative. 
But there seems to be a really strong correlation. Yes, there's a question. Um, what he was the two broad vectors he was looking at. One was uh, lines of code, just how how physically large is that community, and the other was uh, commits, inbound commits. So how vibrant the community is. Um, that's actually the thing that I've always found interesting about Olo as a data resource. I mean, there there are edges in Olo. It's it's by no means perfect, but the interesting thing is it really is looking at commits and lines of code and and. It doesn't matter what people say they do. This is a really hard measurement of exactly what they are doing. So it, it's a, to me, to me, it's kind of that first thing when I hear of a project I've never heard of before. I go pull up Olo, and y I don't even have to. If, if it's not in Olo today, you can basically point Olo at their repository, and you know, you wait a couple hours, and it'll have ground its way through that repository and produce the, the statistics for you. And so it's a really interesting way to go see how active a project might be and how many people are listed as submitters, really. Not the, oh yeah, we have a great big community. No, this is exactly how many people have committed to that code base. Um, and it's exactly how big and how vibrant it is with its commits. And so, so the, you know, Henrik's numbers were really kind of telling. And again, these, so these are the, uh, the, these nine large communities of interest. Uh, GNU, is, it was kind of the base of the, the GNU project hubbed under the Free Software Foundation. Um, Perl, he included CPAN in that, so you got to see the breadth of the Perl community, not just the Perl engine itself. Um, so you've got kind of these really interesting observations that again, and, and so again, looking at this theory of, okay, so, you know, foundations, what's it all about? What's, what's this connection? And to me, and it, this was Henrik's actual uh, observation, like there is this kind of glass ceiling. And what the glass ceiling is when you start looking at the history of foundation, it's corporation. If you've done everything well, you really did. Uh, Kasuki is giving a talk across the hallway right now on Jenkins uh, for continuous in integration. But I saw a talk he gave a couple of years ago in London that was absolutely fabulous. And, and he was talking about how you have to be relentless in making your open source project easy to install, trivial to install, because that's the only way you're going to get users. And you're not going to get contributors until you have users. So you've got to make it re you know, relentless, relentless work on making it easy to install. And then you've got to make it trivial to build so that people that might be interested in contributing can get to where they, they're going. Um, one of the, the most shocking things I ever uh, saw in my background was, I've, I worked for Microsoft for five years back in the uh, early part of the last decade. And uh, for a year, year and a half in the middle there, I worked on a project called Rotor. And what this was, it was not an open source project at all. It, it was a, an academic license on it. It was purely for research. There was no commercial, you, know, you couldn't do anything with the code beyond research. But what we did was we took a cut through the entire .NET uh, common language runtime. And so we're talking a half million lines of code and a half million lines of test harness. And we published it all so you could really go see how the base class library did things and the rest of it. And when, when uh, we made it trivial to build, and it really was. And the entire documentation we had for it was like two screenfuls that said, this is how to build it, and it was like a basically a make script. This is how to test it, another make script, and this was the expected test results. And there was like a known couple of dozen failures at that point in history. And the rest of that couple of screens of documentation was, and here's how the tree kind of lays out. And the next day, like 24 hours later, we got a 15-line patch to the JIT that gave us a 10% boost in performance. So it was a guy that knew, you know, just in time technology really, really well. He knew the Intel chipset really, really well. And this was designed to build and run on uh, Windows, FreeBSD, and Mac OS X. And he basically went in there and went like, here. And he served us up. Now, the interesting piece of the economics there, that might have been the only thing of value in that human being <laughs> for this project. Like, clearly a really smart human being. But that might have been the only thing that he could ever could have contributed to us. And he did. And it was shocking to see because we'd made it so easy to build. And we told him, so it was, 
for any of you guys that have downloaded a project that you've never been a party to before, and you download it, and, and the first thing is, you have no idea how to build it. They've given you no information. That, that just drives me nuts when you do that on, on, on an open source project. Like, you have no sense of, and then even if you could kind of, you, you've built something, you have no idea if what you've built is what they intended you to build. So, you, you know, you, you can waste days of your life just getting to the point that you might want to contribute. So if you make it relentlessly easy to contribute, great things happen. But I digress, I'm sorry. Um, there's, there's this sense, though, that when you're doing all of these things well, you will eventually get to a community size that, um, that, that kind of that life cycle I is very organic, but you will hit a point where corporations show up, commercial interests show up. And at this point, you're going to have to start thinking about IP management. You, you put a, a, an open source license on your project. That was kind of your contrary social contract with your community. This is how we're going to build code together. And you've worked together for some period of time. You're releasing software, but you've now hit this point where companies are showing up and they're going, uh, we'd, like to we'd like to contribute. The ASF exists because IBM wanted to use the Apache engine at the heart of WebSphere. And, I mean, at that point, it, it's 1997, Apache already rules the internet kind of thing. It was, you know, what was it, two-thirds of all websites on the planet were being run through it at that point already. And IBM thought, well, you know, we, we'd like to use that. Why would you go and reinvent it all as just a piece of your overall product portfolio? And at that point in history, there was no IP management on, on the Apache engine. None. It was, it was pretty impressive. I, and, and it was the thing that surprised me about that was I was already used to the Free Software Foundation's way of doing things, where you had, like, if you were going to contribute to a, a project under the auspices of the Free Software Foundation, and I, I was, uh, I helped found a company, we were building kind of the Unix space on NT, and so we were, we were grabbing everything that was free and open source software. As fast as we could build it, we put it into the product. And there was lots of stuff we were trying to contribute back to, and, it, and so I've uh, on behalf of my engineering team to the, the compiler guys, we were contributing to GCC. And so I happily assigned our work over to the Free Software Foundation. So I was used to a very rigorous kind of uh, contribution mechanism around the actual IP management. And you got to uh, the Apache world in 97, and like, there's none of that. Um, at this point in history, they really couldn't do the backtrace to figure out where all the contributions had come from. That's why they use this idea of the Apache license applies to the, the, the uh, whole aggregate work. I mean, it, it's, it's a well understood legal principle, but it's, it's not that they can actually apply it to the individual pieces of Apache. It's not, and it's the aggregate work has the Apache license on it, because that's the only way they can do it. And so you end up in this place where corporations want to come and play, and you need to put a foundation in place. That's, that's what we do. So foundations are these nonprofit businesses. I, I always flag the fact, but you do have to run it as a business. And there's lots of different ways to run that model. Um, yeah, Bradley's seen the, the hard end of uh, working with pure contributions. I'm lucky enough that I'm seeing it from the point of view of uh, sponsoring members that are you know, annual dues kind of thing. But there's lots of ways to fund it. But you do obviously have to run it like a business. You, you know, it's the old spend less than you earn kind of problem. Um, and that's what, what we do. We provide legal structure. We provide business operations. That's what all of these foundations do in different models. I mean, Apache does it through uh, predominantly everybody's a volunteer. Uh, Free Software Foundation does it as a mix of volunteers and paid employees. Uh, Eclipse Linux Foundation Outer Curve does it as a set of fully paid employees all the time. Um, so uh, yeah, our projects are still run as traditional open source projects, but the actual employees providing the back end, those are all paid employees. And so the thing to, to distinguish is, so these, these are foundations, because again, that you often run into this space where, you know, these, these are corporate projects. So these are not foundations. Yes, there's a dot .org out there. But like, make no mistake. Now, the interesting thing, Symbian is an in, is an interesting example because that was a foundation that failed, and it failed dramatically. Um, I did a little bit of consulting with uh, Nokia and Symbian Limited as they were doing the merger before they spun the foundation out the door, and 
it, it came down to Nokia was unwilling to let go. So even though they created a fully separate nonprofit organization, Nokia still had absolute control all the time. And so the, they, they bootstrapped on day one, and all of the original Symbian board members basically jumped into the Symbian Foundation as sponsoring members. And this was, everybody was very excited. Um, but literally, Nokia was running it as, well, we control the Symbian OS, and we will publish into the foundation, and that's where everybody else will get their bit. And that, like, at that point, that put all the rest of the board members um, on the wrong foot. Like, it was no longer kind of this neutral nonprofit. It was Nokia's neutral nonprofit kind of thing. It was absolutely an arm. And, and it was. Within the year, they started rapidly losing uh, members. Members just weren't well, well earning up. Yes? Sure. Uh, no, the Feathers Apache. Yeah. So it's the Apache Software Foundation, the Free Software Foundation, the Eclipse Foundation, the Linux Foundation, which is about five years old now, but it started life as the o uh, OSDL and the Free Standards Group. Uh, Outer Curve, the Doc, and th these aren't the only ones. I mean, there's lots of other foundations out there. Uh, GNOME is the proper foundation. I mean, I, I just kind of threw them up as examples, more for the contrast to the, to the next slide. Yes? Uh, pretty much a mix. Uh, Outer Curve, Linux, and Eclipse are all T6s. Uh, Free Software Foundation, the Conservancy, which uh, Bradley runs, uh, and is not up there. The Free Software Foundation, Apache, the doc I think the Documents Foundation is a T3 as well. But so I just, again, I just did a mix. Um, so, yeah, Sy Symbian did create a foundation. It just, they didn't put any of the neutrality into it that you need, that the, all the rest of the real foundation kind of supported. And without that neutrality, there's no reason for people to, you know, to pay their dues in. Because they were clearly second class citizens, even though they were first class, you know, first class members and second class citizens on day one. So it, it collapsed dramatically. Um, and it, that, that was really what, what it was about. They, they had all the mechanisms in place. The other thing that was bizarre was their cost structure. Uh, when I was talking to them, the biggest foundation I know of to date uh, was the Eclipse Foundation with about 16 full-time employees. Now, I, I've, I've heard a recent number that the Linux Foundation has grown considerably, but I know that they do a lot of that on employees that are seconded in from, other, from their member companies, so I'm not sure how many true uh, employees, but that, that's kind of a big foundation. I mean, Outer Curve is three full-time employees, and we use a management company for a lot of our back-end operations. Symbian started with 120 people. And it was like, and I kind of went, what? What are they doing? <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I, that, that one still took my breath away. So their cost structure was buggered as well. Um, the, the new one, the, you know, New Kids on the Block, that I think is going to be fascinating to watch to see if it, if, if it performs to the theory, so to speak, uh, is OpenStack. And again, we saw a, a situation where politically everybody was really unhappy with the fact that it didn't matter that it was you know OpenStack.org. At the end of the day, it was Rackspace running the, running the show, and all of these other people were getting more and more nervous about the fact that you know we're committing a lot of our R and D investment and a lot of our corporate reason of existing around this OpenStack thing, and they really wanted that neutrality. So this is this is why it matters. Corporations show up. Corporations need clean IP, and they need clean IP for a couple of reasons that we'll talk about. Um, but the neutrality issue is also important. Again, it, it, it's the right now I, we're seeing a lot of companies like the, the modern internet, so the, the Twitters of the world, the Facebook, the um, Netflix. These are companies that their entire business is internet-based. They have enormous server farms, and they. They understand the benefits they've already received building their world out of open source, and they're now they've they've kind of invented these next chunks of software that allow you to scale in interesting ways, and they know that that's not key to their business. It's all about the data and whatever the content is they're streaming. That's the, you know the crown jewels of the corporation. So they are happily creating new and interesting open source projects in this kind of new internet-enabled business model, and it's fabulous. 
and they're parking them on GitHub because that's the cool place to park your stuff today. And it's like, there's not a lot of corporate involvement because at the end of the day, it's not neutral. It's, it's the open stack problem. It's a why would I give my R&D investment to you? And if you're a small company that isn't you know, lawyered up all the time, yeah, you know, of course we'll contribute there. But if you're an Intel, you've got a wall of lawyers going, don't give that away. You know, and it's that black and white. It's like, you know, we aren't giving that away unless we have very well understood agreements between us. So the neutrality thing is really important. Um, clean IP, it encourages adoption as well. This was the IBM you know, creating the Apache Software Foundation. Uh, if you have, if you, if you have well-managed copyright, well-managed on top of the, a, a well-managed set of repositories, you know, a clean engineering process. I would argue that without a good engineering process, you can't scale an open source project. Just like you can't ship software as a, as a product cost effectively, you can't scale a community without a clean engineering process. Um, but the clean IP is what actually encourages adoption. So, you know, we could use Apache as IBM kind of thing now. Um, a, a lot of, uh, when the OSDL was spun up around Linux, that opened the floodgates for a lot of corporate involvement. And I'd argue that a lot of these things, um, the success of open source and free software is actually tied up in these commercial uses. It's because it's so valued and corporations start to participate. That, that is the, the kind of the economic pull through effect on open source. When you look at all of those, uh, the, the, you know, like nine big projects, um, the only one that kind of is, is a little weird there would be Perl, but then the world runs on Perl for a very long time uh, at the system administration level. And so it's, it's that kind of a, a pull through there, but it's all about actual real world use commercial vectors that, that pull all of this through. And then once you have a foundation in place, you end up with this kind of community center of gravity. It, it spins things out. You, you end up with the ability to start hosting conferences and doing bigger things for your community. That, you know, Fox Dem and Scale are awesome conferences, but there's still a lot of work with an enormous volunteer base that makes them successful. And when you start turn it around and start looking at the investment in something like ApacheCon or FlipCon or things like that, you start seeing a different, uh, a different feel to those uh, conferences as well. Not necessarily a better feel, I'll be clear. I love Scale. Um, Uh, you end up with that, the, the neutrality is, is the thing that helps people over that wall of inbound contribution. So, you know, I, I'd argue that the Twitters of the world, the, the Netflixes, they, they need to start talking to foundations. Uh, and, you know, they need to find a model that works for them. But that's when they'll start to see real interesting growth around the projects that they've been uh, happily publishing under open source and free software licenses for a while now. Um, and that's, you know, I guess I've really al already talked about this. You, you see that um, that neutrality of ownership is what causes this uh, commercial marketplace to happen. Uh, I, I recently ran into somebody that I, I was shocked that some people still run around with this opinion. Uh, that was the whole Richard Stallman is against people making money on free software. And it was like, no. <laughs> I, I actually, it was quick enough to Google the quote from 97, and I know he said it before then, too, but I was trivially able to find a quote from him in 97. I, it, 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 these are the things that enable market growth around these interesting projects. And we have actually talked about that. Um, so the, the kind of legal things that we all put in play, um, so, like I said, you, you've invariably you've started the project with a license. Um, we've seen licenses evolve over time because the legal landscape around free and open source software has evolved over the last 25 years. We, we care about different things now. Um, at this point, you'd be hard pressed to find a modern open source license that doesn't talk about patents. It doesn't mean it supports the idea of software patents, but there's software patents are a legal reality we have to live with. So all of the modern ones, and the, uh, the most recent uh, one I, I think was the uh, Mozilla 2.0 license. And even though the original Mozilla license was written uh, by corporate lawyers back when Netscape was spinning up the Mozilla project, we're now in a place where uh, Mozilla's 2.0 license is, is a much cleaner license. 
accounting for all the differences that we're 15 years past the original Mozilla project. I mean, that is the thing that's kind of shocking with some of these things, is just how old some of these projects are. And again, this, this whole idea that, oh, open source is finally coming of age. I mean, come on, man. There's, there's not a piece of email that anybody in this room sends that still doesn't talk to, you know, step through a send mail server at some point. Uh, and that's been out there for 30 years now. Um, we'll often put assign either assignments or contribution license uh, mechanisms in play. Uh, these are a fascinating debate. Uh, there was a period of time where um, a lot of us that cared about this kind of thing got involved in a, a project called Harmony that was attempting to come up with some common language around assignments and uh, contribution license agreements. Because again, we're, we're, you're trying to get people, corporations, you need to help them over that hurdle to contribute. And they want some sense of, well, what's the provenance tracking you're doing and how do you track your paperwork? At the same time, there's huge debate. Do you do it with assignments? I, one of the best talks I ever saw was actually Eben Mogelin on stage with Larry Rosen. And Eben is a hardcore, you always do assignments. Now, he, he s maintains that perspective from a foundation nonprofit point of view. Because this is the thing where MySQL was the counterexample. And what's happened with MySQL is, is the easy counterexample at this point in history. We used to talk about, well, what if some, somebody else owned MySQL? Because they used to do everything with assignment agreements. And then Sun bought them. And that was still, well, Sun was at least waving the flag in reasonably good way. And then Oracle bought them, kind of thing. And at this point, it's like Oracle's been very clear that it really doesn't care about their community around MySQL. And so yeah, all those people that contributed to MySQL back in the day and gave their full assignment of copyright to MySQL AB, they don't have a leg to stand on. Larry Rosen, on the other hand, is a guy that is, no, you never give up your ownership of your software. You worked hard on that. Of course you'd license it in. And, and again, so y even within our own industry and, and the broader open source community, you know, opinions differ here. And I had an interesting debate with our lawyers when, when I joined the Outer Curve Foundation. I said, so do we care which way we go with this? Because we'll, we'll let a project choose. If you want to do things with assignment, great. If you want to do things with license, great. But I was talking to our lawyers because they're a little freaked out about this. Because I was very much behind the Free Software Foundation way of doing things with assignments. And our, my lawyer, and she's one of the better lawyers on open source uh, based in Silicon Valley. And she kind of wrote the book for other lawyers on, on some of this stuff. And she kind of shrugged it off. It was kind of like, yeah, assignments, it means you could change the license if you wanted. Yeah, you can have the argument about whether it's easier to defend than a legal challenge. So she said, you'll have more fight and you'll waste more legal money trying to figure out the provenance tracking over somebody yelling at you than, than any of your you know, kind of paper tracking. That it's, it'll all come down to how good a, how good was your actual provenance tracking, and can you really identify the, the, the source, and can you really identify who gave it to you? Uh, next question up here. Um, who owned it? Where did it come from? So it is just tracking the. W did, did this come from who it, who said they gave it to you? Um, did they write it? Was it original work? So it, it's just, it, you know, I, I use the word in the same way that people will talk about the provenance of a, of a you know, a famous master's uh, piece of art kind of thing. Is, is that really a Picasso kind of thing? And how do you know it was really a Picasso? So it's that same kind of idea, um, but applied to, um, so we, we run the paperwork. Um, I, again, I don't care what Forge, any uh, open source project under our purview is, is using. And frankly, uh, we, we always said it kind of in a, well, we don't care. Whereas it's proven to be a really good thing because now that um, Git and GitHub are becoming so powerful, um, you're seeing a lot of huge debates go on within the Eclipse world and the Apache world as they move themselves, at least to Git, as a fully distributed uh, configuration management environment even though they aren't doing it on GitHub itself. And so our, we've got projects on GitHub. We had one on Launchpad for a while. We've got stuff on uh, CodePlex.com, which is Microsoft's open source kind of collected website. Um, 
but that's the thing I care about. Kind of, it, uh, we'll happily run your IP paperwork for you, but I need to know, you need to prove to me, if you're bringing a project to me, that you actually are really living in your version control environment. You really do know how to do automated builds. So, you know, it doesn't matter that I've got all this great signed paperwork for your project if you can't tell me that that really, that commit there happened from that person. So that's the provenance tracking into this. Um, liability and risk management uh, and commit, committer indemnification. So we indemnify our committers. They are doing work on behalf of the, the foundation. It's not that we think anybody would ever go after them personally in a lawsuit, but the law allows it. So, you know, kind of it's the added, added benefit of we will indemnify our committers. I believe Apache and Eclipse do as well. Uh, you know, it's just, it's kind of a, it's an easy thing to offer up as, a, a, as an organization. Um, the liability and risk management. I mean, it's, yes, all of the open source licenses have the really big capitalized paragraph at the bottom of them saying, you know, you can't do anything with this and sue me. But at the end of the day, there's still, a corporation cares about that arm's length kind of risk mitigation of, it's not the corporation, it's the foundation that would take the hit. So uh, that, that, again, it's kind of thing, things that we do along the way. So the thing, at, at the end of the day, uh, and, and it's, it's, it's an interesting debate, because again, when, when we st started uh, looking at this, um, I have to trust the committers on our project. At the end of the day, it comes down to domain expertise. And that's the only way you can really do it. Uh, there, there's lots of code scanning tools out there. You know, Some of them are less expensive, some of them are more expensive. But really, at the end of the day, it comes down to domain expertise. And uh, we, I, I saw a situation again at uh, while I worked for a large software founder, a uh, large software corporation that shall remain nameless, that might be freaked out by the GPL. And one of the product uh, engineers was about to patch in some code, and realized, wait a minute, I've seen that code before. And even though it had been stripped of its copyright, he recognized the function names that were in it. And because, again, it was domain, domain experience that allowed him to recognize that he actually knew that that was GPL software because he'd uh, worked around it. Th he'd used that stuff before when he was at university. So it, it, it comes down to, like, that, that was a lucky, lucky catch that day. Um, that's to me why, as as an added check, right? When you when you see the number of hoops you go through to release a product in large corporations, I think all of them should just buy the whatever the you know two two of the most expensive tools they can find out there, just as part of the build process on the back end before they ship, just just so they know that you know somebody's done a certain amount of code matching against you know fingerprinting libraries and things like that. But at the end of the day, you're not going to know. I mean, the other thing was so what's what's a legally significant contribution. We get into that debate. Um, I believe, because, again, I went back to my lawyer. She's, she's a software copyright lawyer. I said, so what's legally significant? When, when do I need a contribution license agreement kind of thing? Um, the magic number that was handed to us was 50 lines. I think Eclipse goes all the way up to 250 lines. Um, I wish, I cannot find the piece of email, but I, I traded email with uh, Mr. Stallman, gotta be 15, 18 years ago. I think the number he pulled out of the air on wh when does the GPL kick into effect was at 17 lines. I'm, I'm sure there was a certain amount of tongue in cheek that day that he was just like, he picked a number because well, like any of these numbers is as relevant or irrelevant <laughs> as any of the rest of them at the end of the day. Um, so again, you know, when you, it's, I have to trust that our, our committers are actually paying attention. And they all care about their projects. I mean, at, at the end of the day, these are people, it's not, these aren't random employees. These are people building their projects. I mean, I, I, was, I was laughing the other day. I, I, 
I remember a period uh, in my career back in the 80s, I was an IT programmer, and the word maintenance struck fear in your heart. You never wanted to be put on maintenance on a project, because that was death. That meant you weren't good enough to be a real developer. At this point, if you had the title Linux maintainer, damn, I, you know, if I was a Linux maintainer, it would be on a t-shirt this big <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, so it's, it's our industry, is, and I think the organic nature of open source. There, there's no such thing as maintenance mode anymore. You're always in maintenance mode. You're always in release mode. So it, it's, to me, it, it, it's kind of these kinds of inversions in our industry are always kind of interesting. Um, Foundations Act is kind of that, that uh, center of gravity for your community. Um, the project should be creating the architecture participation, um, but not all projects are you know have kind of strong leadership all the time. So one of the things we did, uh, you'll see um, incubation at Apache and Eclipse. That's the way you become an Apache, a, a full Apache project or a full Eclipse project as you go through an in incubation phase, and that's basically you're you're absorbing the culture. Um, what we've done at Outer Curve, because our, we, we've got such disparity across the projects that are coming to us, is we put a mentorship in play. But again, it's that idea of making sure that you are doing everything for the community to build a strong community to get those contributions flowing. Because contributions are the lifeblood of any project, right? It's all about the code at the end of the day. So, um, we, we don't provide a forge, but many of the other foundations do. Now, come back to the conclusion. So that, that was, this has been my theory of foundations. Uh, at the end of the day, foundations are absolutely critical and essential to enabling real growth beyond a certain, you know, the, you, you hit Henrik's glass ceiling, so to speak, of uh, what's that next step? Well, that next step is corporate involvement. And once you have corporations in, involved, then you have to step up to put certain legal uh, risk mitigation tools in place because that's just a, a result of dealing with corporations. And the interesting thing that foundations do by, by enabling that is it means that the projects can continue to grow and thrive and kind of reach that next level. And at the same time, the, you know, the, the developers who are so essential to those projects don't lose the cycle trying to do all the things that are, you know, the business operations, holding the bank accounts, running the legal paperwork, all of those kinds of things. And that's all I have to say today. Are there any other questions? Sir. That's a hell of a diagram when you see the eclipse. <laughs> I tend to side with you on that in, in the debate. It's the, 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 the hardest thing I have is when, when uh, Richard Fontana and I had that debate in, in email once, because he's absolutely hardcore, as a lawyer, has turned that corner. And uh, I even when you see things like Clark Assay's uh, recent uh, work on, you know, he's a lawyer teaching out of Penn State, and his thing is, why can't we all just do this as public domain? And there's a part of me that really wants to think that is the right way to do it. I, I understand, but that, that idea of kind of pulling away these layers and layers of, of providence managing, IT tracking, all of this stuff, because at the end of the day, I, when I started getting, um, so I've been involved either actively engaged with using free software and open source in product or actively avoiding it. I used to work for MKS back in the early 90s, and we had to be IP clean because we were selling our stuff to other people. Um, it, I've seen corporations get very twisted up in knots and not come and participate because their perceived risk vector isn't being met. And so I would like to 
be in that better world. But at this point, I'd also, I really want to see that corporate involvement. I really want to see that growth. Right. And I, th I think that would be, I would love to see more of that discussion happen of we're losing taxes because. And, and again, I, I, I want to make sure that that conversation is like that, that data point, not a company that's not getting its taxes because somebody wasn't willing to assign their stuff to me. You know, uh, the, the MySQL problem. Uh, And, and it's watching uh, uh, Microsoft go through some of, some of its, you know, kind of soul searching on a lot of this stuff. It, it was equally um, the, the the years I spent inside of Microsoft were, were a, a, a wonderful education. Um, but the interesting thing to me is, I thought IBM had hostile conservative lawyers, and then I went to work for Microsoft, and I have never seen such conservative legal interpretations in my life. And there's, and it, and it is, it's not, the, the aggression isn't about animosity, it's out of fear. They are so terrified of losing control of their patent portfolio because of somebody contributing, miscontributing on an op open source project. And it's like, guys, show me the lawsuit. And nobody can show you the lawsuit. And that's the thing, is we are all going through these hoops out of basically corporate conservative lawyers are fearful. That and, and, and in their minds, they're, they're doing the right thing by their clients. I'm serving my clients. I'm making sure that we never, and you go like, guys, because that is legally possible does not make it legally probable. And you know, it's just astounding to me. It, yeah, and it's one of those things where I, so at Microsoft, I went through the process of, of getting a software patent. A buddy and I came up with an, an, an anti-spam idea, and the, they threw the corporate lawyers at us, and we thought, we don't really agree with patents, but what the hell, let's see what the process looks like from the inside. And I was astounded at how, I mean, this was not rifle shots of how they would very explicitly define something. This was that period of about 10 years ago when they were shotgun blasting. You know, they, they had this patent worded in such a way that it might be able to be applied to text messaging spam. I was like, that is, that's relevant. It would never work that way, kind of thing. But now, it, it's all of this stuff, it, it, the, the legal system continues to astound me. I mean, despite the fact that I, I have a well paying job to, to do this stuff for a living, I'm still shaking my head at the fact that you know, the, my, my, my canonical example when I get into the debate with lawyers is, is Apache. Apache has run on the order of two-thirds of the websites of the planet for what, 15 to 20, 20 years now. Apache started in I think 92, 93 time frame. So it's been 20 years now. And it, it's kind of had that percentage. Yeah, it's up a little, down a little, and it's drifting down a little because of uh, Nginx right now and things like that. But, but it's had that order of, of magnitude for this long. Okay, so you'd think You'd think somewhere along the way, if there was a way to sue all those companies using Apache, some clever lawyer would have figured this out by now. Hasn't happened, and that's the thing. I mean, and when when they when they come up with the, the copyright battle around Linux, um, so I was working for Microsoft at the time when that when Sco Group started, and uh, the the team I was in, uh, so I was part of the, the an organization that was. Call it the consulting arm, the, the McKinsey of the Windows team, if you would. It, we, like we, 
we've got all the special projects kind of thing. And my, my job was to figure out what is the engagement mechanism with open source for a couple of years. And it was not take the legs out from under it. It, it was very much so. This, this was a period of time when there were other people in the Windows organization running around doing the shared source messaging and all that stuff. But my job was what is the actual engagement mechanism? Well, you know, what's happening here? Why do people do this economically? And so I was in this team when the SCO group thing started, and there was an enormous number of non-practicing lawyers on the team, and they were ecstatic. Boy, will customers recognize now how important IT management is. I was like, I'm pretty sure when I bought my you know, Honda, I did not think about Honda's patent strategy. Um, I'm, 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 I can really assure you of that. Customers don't care about this stuff. And you know, if I actually received a letter from Toyota, saying that me driving my Honda was infringing a Toyota patent, I am pretty sure that I'd, I'd been it. And when I got the second or third notice, I'd probably call my Honda dealer and say, deal with this. <laughs> you know, like, this is just noise. Customers don't care. That's problem one. Problem two, I said, guys, they're suing IBM. This was a year after IBM had publicly committed a billion dollars of investment in Linux. At, uh, you know, they, they were at, up on, at Linux World in Jacob Javits in New York. You know, they publicly committed a billion dollars. To, okay, billion dollar investment. And SCO's running around, SCO Group's running around going, you're infringing our copyright. I'm thinking, you know guys, and, and I explained this to the lawyers and they just kind of looked at me like I wasn't speaking English. I said, it's pretty simple. IBM could hire the entire graduating Harvard Law class this year to do legal busy work for the next two to three years on this page. And one of two things is going to happen. Either SCO Group will run out of money and crater, or IBM will find out they're actually dirty. At which point, if they, if they find out, oh, we made a mistake somewhere along the way, because, you know, mistakes happen. At that point, SCO Group will be worth about, you know, there won't be $150 million anymore, there'll be about 10 and IBM will buy them and the whole problem will go away. Like, that's how this is going to end. You know, customers are not going to wake up tomorrow and start thinking, oh, I better stop using Linux kind of thing. And yeah, we saw the first thing pan out. I mean, basically, SCO group traders, and it, it's done now. So in this space, we are spending enormous amounts of money chasing after legal possibilities. But, you know, and, and they'll do the, oh, well, you know, the Free Software Foundation and, the, and a couple of organizations like that have gone after you know, people that are infringing on things. Well, yeah, and uh, I, I remember uh, Bradley gave a tutorial a few years ago at OzCon on, on this, and he said, like, it's the easiest thing in the world. It's like, you explain it to their lawyers, and their lawyers kind of look at it, and they go, huh, you're right. <laughs> I guess we are infringing. And they fix it, because <laughs> you know, at the end of the day, they were wrong. Yeah, and it's, it's still amazing. Anyway, thank you very much for us, for that. Make it quick. Two minutes. So the budget that I saw for setting up the C6, that is uh, the Outer Curve Foundation, by the time all the dust had settled, our filings with the IRS, all the rest of that stuff, uh, and, and putting the formal agreements in place, uh, bylaws and the rest of it, I think it was about $150,000 to $200,000 by the time it was all done. And that's the thing, that, that really comes down to how you're selling your membership or how you accept contributions. I mean, like C3s have a very different model than C6s. C6s, we do, a, we do a membership model, we have sponsors, Eclipse has members, and then it comes down to, again, how do you, it, it, that's, that's where they, these are all businesses. You have to run them as a business because you are basically providing a service, you need a revenue stream, and it's how do you match that. And there's, there's no one right way that I've seen. I mean, when you look across the dozen or so proper open source foundations that are out there right now, I think you've got a dozen different uh, financial models. I don't think any of us are doing it the same way. Thank you.
folks.